Few people have been quite as instrumental in the bike industry over the last 25 years as Gerard Vrooman. It's nice to have rules because then you can find ways around it or ways that they didn't intend. So, so the more rules, the better. Co-founder of Cervelo, where he helped to usher in a new era in bike aerodynamics. So like, why wouldn't you want that advantage on a road bike? Then co-founder at Open Cycle, where he turned his attention to gravel. I mean, if you're not riding the Tour de France, Meaning fa going fast just means you're home sooner, right? And what's that? And then also head of design at 3T, responsible for a new wave of gravel, road and e-bikes. I wanted to speak to him about the early years at Cervelo, to find out how aero road bikes became a thing, to find out how he helped to change an industry and to hear his assessment of the latest developments in aerodynamics. Gerard Ruman, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on a call to talk history of aero road bikes, because I think you are uniquely placed. I'm going to say now that you were one of the originators, the inventors, but perhaps you'll, uh, you'll disagree later. I don't know. Um, can we go back to the beginning, first of all, the, the origins of Cervelo? How did you and Phil White actually meet? Uh, we met. I did my final year project uh, at McGill University, and I... Uh, scanned that to be uh, the design of a bike. So that was kind of what I was interested in. And um, and then in the same lab, uh, Phil did a different project and we end up uh, making the very first uh, Cervelo. Oh, I mean, Cervelo didn't exist back then, but that bike was sort of the, the nucleus of, uh, of Cervelo. So, and that bike you're referring to, is that the Baraki? Yeah, that's hanging there in my office, but it's uh, out of sight. So maybe I'll, uh, I'll take it down later on uh, for the end of the show, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's one of the most outrageous looking TT bikes in an era of outrageous looking TT bikes. What was the inspiration for that particular bike? Uh, well, there were really two. The, the first one was to really take the airflow from the front wheel and, and guide it as well as possible to the rear wheel. So... To do that, we put the, the wheels as close together as possible. So everything is like the minimum UCI allowed uh, dimensions because, you know, a lot of UCI rules didn't exist back then, but those did exist. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, the wheelbase is only 89 centimeters. So that's about, you know, let's say 10% shorter than what you would find now as a, as a really short bike. And then the second was to integrate the rider with the bike. So the, you know, the aero bars go in between the hands and, or, and the forearms instead of, you know, just under them or around them. And so that was, uh, those are really the two things. And I, I read that you designed it for Gianni Bugno and he liked it, but he wasn't allowed to use it. Is that right? Yeah. It's, uh, well, you know, bike sponsors usually are not too crazy, but uh, people riding uh, bikes other than their own. So uh yeah, that was uh, sort of how it went. We showed it to the team and that was all good. And then uh, the bike sponsor said, uh, never. It's quite striking, though, that the aerodynamics were clearly like your your thing from the earliest days. Why was that? Because I suppose the 90s, there was a lot of talk, particularly with outrageous TT bikes, about aerodynamics. So had you taken inspiration from something like the Lotus that had come out four years previously or was it no, not really? really i was uh as a as a teenager i was into human powered vehicles so i was really i mean these kind of race bikes they were really pretty pedestrian to me i was kind of you know i had to go at least 100 kilometers an hour not 50 so i was in the in the human powered vehicle scene and then of course mike burrows uh you know was really big in in, uh, in hpvs with the wind cheetah and he was of course also the you know the real inventor of the of the Lotus bike. So, um, and there were other people like the the man who started the International Human Powered Vehicle Association, Chet Kyle. He was the one who designed uh, the bikes for the U.S. Olympic team in '84 and again in '96. And so I had some contact with people who sort of straddled the the human powered vehicle and the normal racing bike worlds. Um, but I was really only interested in the in human powered vehicles, not in the in normal racing bikes. Um, and that sort of changed, I think in uh, around 93, I organized a conference and Chad Kyle was one of the speakers and he was called like, oh, you know, it's kind of nice to design bikes for the Olympics because, you know, the rules that I always thought the rules were ridiculous and they were sort of hampering you. They said like, it's nice to have rules because then you can find ways around it or ways that they didn't intend. So, so the more rules, the better. 
Right. You know what? That explains an awful lot, actually. Not only the inspiration behind, you know, your passion for aerodynamics, but also then I was actually going to ask you a question of how you felt when the UCI then banned bikes like the Baraki and the, the 97, the infamous Lugano Charter. And I was going to say, well, how did you find the inspiration to carry on with Cervelo if, you know, you were being restricted? But am I right in thinking now that it was simply another challenge for you now the UCI had restricted things so much? Yeah, it was. I mean, the Baraki was was nice to build one, but it was never going to be possible to build more than a couple anyways. It was just a terrible bike, really, from a production point of view. So so we'd already sort of set that goodbye. But certainly the new rules of the UCI was implementing for the year 2000, right? Of course, they adopted them earlier, but they came into effect in 2000. And so we really we took those rules and, and studied them instead of really complaining about them, I guess. Um, and so in the year 2000, we introduced a P3, which was the first, you know, the Tatra bike with the curved uh, seat tube that curved around the rear wheel and really shielded that nicely. And so that was really a step forward from our from our previous design. So in the, two, in the year 2000, a lot of people made a step back to sort of dumb their bikes down to make them fit the rules. But we, you know, found sort of a way to, to make a step forward. So that, that was really what, what put Cervelo on the map. That's, that's cool. So let's talk specifically then about the the aero road bike where did the inspiration come from for that was it your passion for aerodynamics or had there been something before in the market that made you think okay yeah we need to we need to do that too i mean our our general idea just came from okay we we know this is important we're building all these time trial bikes like why wouldn't you want that advantage on a road bike and of course that advantage is smaller if you're sitting in the middle of the pack uh but you know, it's hard to win a race in the middle of the pack. So at some point, you got to go to the front, right? So if you go 100 kilometers to the front, then uh, aerodynamics, then it's just a time trial, right? Without uh, aero bars. So, but even if you're a sprinter, at least at some point, you got to be in the wind if you want to win. So, uh, so we realized that the advantages were smaller, but they weren't zero. So if you could get those advantages in uh, without, you know, too much of a, a weight penalty or stiffness penalty or then it would be advantageous to do that. So we were always interested in that. Uh, we just didn't get the same exposure for the aero road bikes as we did for the time trial triathlon bikes, just because of you know visibility in the sport. It's a lot easier to be visible in triathlon, for example, than that is in road racing. Right? You don't need to sponsor a whole team, or um, so that's sort of where we got our start from a say a sales and a visibility point of view. But our interest was always there. Uh, and to your point about uh, the first in the market, I mean, I think really the first to take aerodynamics seriously and try to put that into the market was a company called Hooker from the States. Never understood why they were in the success with a name like that. But um, anyway, so they, they did a lot of car parts and things like that. And they designed uh, also initially time trial bikes, and a lot of track, track bikes uh, mostly, um, especially in the States. And they also had a, a road version of that. And the, the track bike, they sold very few of because track is just you know not that popular in most parts of the world. Um, and then a road bike, they sold even fewer of. Um, and so we actually, I remember we bought the last hooker time trial bike that they had. So they stopped doing it and went back to concentrating on their other businesses. And they were clearing out their stuff when we bought the last hooker frame, fork, seat post, uh, aero bars, like an integrated system, beautiful, uh, uh, beautiful setup, uh, very impractical if you want to sell a lot of them. Uh, but uh, yeah, for, for one-offs, that was really, uh, I think that was really the start and the first people to take it seriously. Maybe maybe at Cervelli, we were the first to really do it consistently and across the line and really try to, to bring it to a, a bigger audience rather than just selling it to, you know, national team members on the track the soloist so the the first of the aero road bikes the brief to my mind seems to have been to make it really narrow and then i think i've read that you had those knacker profile tubes that that you were actually extruding in order to get them is that fair that that was the the initial concept of aerodynamics yeah, so the first, the very first bikes we made, um, we didn't actually extrude them ourselves. We had, um, I mean, I don't know, this is mostly North America, I think, where, where people just build their own planes and you just can just buy aero tubes. These were for landing struts. And so you could buy those 
and then we built bikes out of them and then we thought okay it's a good profile but you know it's designed for a couple hundred kilometers an hour that this airplane goes not not for bikes so then pretty soon we said okay we can do a bit better and also you know with the wall thickness just makes it a little bit more optimized for what we need so then we moved from you know these these standard tubes that you could buy for your plane to to extruding our own tubes with a little bit better profile and still naka but uh, you know more for lower speeds that seems to me. So how did you change the profile? If we're getting a bit nerdy. What what was the difference? Yeah, I mean, they're just subtle subtle ways in that. I mean, of course, at the nose is the, the most important part, right? Where you try, where you have to split the the airflow, and it just gets, um, you know, the the lower the speed is, the less energy the airflow has, so the less it can really adopt it to to change it, everything like that. So just the nose profile uh, changed, and of course, um, you know those. Those struts, they weren't really uh, made with UCI rules in, in mind. So, uh, but you know, when we were making our own tubes, then we could really think about okay, what, how can we maximize our shapes within within the rules, right? And especially then in '97, uh, when the new uh, rule book came out, and you know, the three to one became something that all of a sudden every cyclist knew what that meant, right? Uh, so then we could, of course, squeeze our tubes in this three to one uh, ratio was. Uh, as well as possible. That bike came out, I think I'm right in saying, the Solus in 2002. And then 2003, you sponsored Team CSC, which was like, I mean, even in 2003, it was one of the kind of big super teams, wasn't it? Did you need to... Yeah, it wasn't them? in 2002. You know, when we went to speak to them, the only reason we went to speak to them was that um, that they were looking for a new bike sponsor. And they were 14th in the UCI ranking when I went to see them in 2002. So they weren't really a super team yet at that point. Um, but I just called uh, <clears throat> somebody at Shimano and said, like, who's looking for a new uh, bike sponsor? And they mentioned two. Uh, one never called me back and the other one did. And that was CSC. So it was uh, Alex Peterson who was their general manager at that time. He uh, said, oh yeah, come over. And then uh, the rest is history. Yeah, well, I mean, it certainly is. That, that's my my brain playing tricks then csc in my mind so distinctive and i suppose they did win a lot over the years but did you need to convince the riders of the benefits of the soloist back then how did how did they take it on board can you remember well at that time we didn't really have to convince them because it was the only road bike we had <laughs> so <laughs> yeah unless they wanted to turn it into a running race they had little little option we had uh it's not completely true we had a steel frame uh, called the Prodigy and the Super Prodigy. And um, they rode that for Paris Roubaix and some other classics, um, which was probably the, the last time by a long shot that really a steel frame was used in those races. So, yeah. So, so then you launched the, the lightweight, the R2.5, because mm -hmm. I, I, I seem to remember reading that all three Tour de France stages that year were on the lightweight bike. Is that once you gave them another option? Well, you know, in order to um, become the supplier uh, to CSC, we had to, you know, we told them we were working on a super light carbon frame and, you know, we had to promise that this this thing would actually be, happen, be happening before the Tour de France in order to, to get that deal. So, um, and of course, they were. Um, I mean, Bjarne Reese, for all his obvious faults, I mean, he was pretty, really into you know the equipment and and really believed in the aerodynamics. But he also knew we had a bunch of riders who just you know really wanted something more comfortable. And of course, they were riding Look before, which was round tube carbon, and then yeah, that's always going to be more comfortable than aero and alloy. So. Um, you know, we had to promise that this uh, R25 would happen, uh, and um, and then we delivered them just before the Tour de France, like at first prototypes at Tour de Suisse or Dauphiné Libre. I can't remember one of the two, uh, and then uh, the whole team got their R25s before the Tour de France. And were you still thinking then that you know the Soloist would be a better bike for those riders? Because obviously the project didn't end there. You, there was another one came yeah. out pretty soon after. Uh, I mean, it's hard to say, right? When we we didn't know anything about, I mean, you think you know how to design a bike and you think you make a pretty good one, but we, of course, we didn't really know about what it takes to ride a Tour de France. 
I mean, the R25 was more comfortable than the Soloist. And is that important over a three-week race? Or is the, I mean, there, there's no data on <laughs> on what's better in, in that sense, right? An alloy aero bike or a carbon uh, round two bike. So, um, you know, and if the team was happy, then then fine. And if you win uh, three stages in your first Tour de France, then you can't say, uh, you know, they chose the wrong bike, right? So... For us, it was uh, for us it was absolutely fine that they chose the R25. But of course, we realized that you know the best of both worlds would be the best of both worlds, which is aero and carbon. Yeah, I, I read so that, that those later iterations of the Soloist, it seemed like prioritizing comfort or at least building comfort into the bike was one of the key parameters. Would you have said that was the primary limitation of aero road bikes in the early days then? They were just simply too stiff? No, I mean, uh, too stiff. I don't, I mean, we were always trying to build comfort into it, but of course you're starting to nil behind when you put a massive down tube and, a, and an aero seat tube on, on the bike. But we were always within those constraints, just like as within the constraints of the UCI rules, we we're always trying to build as much comfort in as possible. Like already... Of course, later on when we made they, like the R3 with the crazy thin seats, days and people started to take note. But if you look at a original alloy soloist that has very small seat stays as well, um, you know, as small as they could be in alloy. And as you evolved the aerodynamics as well, I guess the the move to carbon liberated you to try different things. But where was your data coming from as the bike evolved? Was it a combination of CFD? wind tunnel in real world where, where did where was your prior oh, cfd is is really i mean in a useful way cfd came after so in the beginning and already before we started cervello we were already going to the wind tunnel you know with people like steve head and um and so that was really you know the old school aerodynamics was just that going to the tunnel you know building some shapes in advance going to the tunnel then using clay and, and sanding things off and whatever to try different shapes and then, uh, you know, taking as many photos as you could so that you could sort of remember what on earth you'd done. And then, you know, figure out, you know, what was the best combination of that and, and, and building that into, uh, into a bike. So also the first uh, carbon frames that we did, like in the tunnel, they would have been, you know, the alloy soloist and with a lot of clay added to it and, and, and then translating that shape into, uh, you know, in, into a cat file that you would then make uh, molds out of. That's really interesting. Then, if we fast forward to to the Cervelo S3 that I've been riding, then Dan Lloyd's old one. What is your memories of that particular iteration of the aero road bikes? How how do you regard it in history? I mean, I think the Soloist Carbon, as that was originally called. Um, I think it's really the first time for us that everything came together, right? It was carbon, it was aero, and the, and, and the carbon allowed not only the, the aero to be better, right? The transitions, of course, between the tubes is much nicer than you would have with welded tubes. But it was also then that point where you could get, um, you know, the, the comfort back in and, and do all these other things. So Now, when I, when I looked at that bike and I rode it, it seems strikingly different to a, a modern aero bike. Why? I mean, can you talk me through the evolution? Because again, that S3 seems like it's gone for the, the the narrow, traditional kind of aerofoil shapes. But now, bikes, aero bikes, they're a lot wider. They've got all, loads of square edges on. So, at what point did you realise that? There was that sort of like step change to make. I don't know if they really got a lot wider. Like in the in the maximum width in a lot of areas, they're they're not. I mean, most down tubes haven't gotten a lot wider. Um, I mean, in some areas, of course, the shield bottles and things like that. Of course, that you know, I think what has happened is two things. First is that cam tails, right? So people go, okay, if you're sticking within the three to one, you can make an airfoil that's a uh, pretty good shape, but you can actually make a much more elongated shape and then cut the rear off. Uh, and then, you know, you sort of hope that the air will keep doing, uh, you know, uh, not, not realizing that the tube is gone. Um, and, you know, and that, and that does work. So you, because of those cam tails, um, the tubes would get a lot 
I mean, uh, like they wouldn't necessarily get wider, but they would just still still be fatter because the, you know the the thin part of it would be gone, right? It would all be wide, let's say, all, all be closer to the maximum width. So that really helps you to get some stiffness in and then get the weight out, and it would help you aerodynamically. So I think that's that's a major change that you now see. You know, these chopped off uh, airfoil shapes on pretty much anything, right? Like be it C posts or C tubes, even down tubes. Um, and then, of course, that, that trend of more integration. So, um, you know, you try to shield your down tube bottle, but then also, of course, especially handlebar stem, these kind of things, right? You you, get, you see a lot more integration now than you would, of course, in those days, uh, you know, running your cables internally. And I think this is one area where uh, the modern bike is actually losing out a little bit. You see a lot of modern bikes now, in order to run the cables internally, they've made the head tubes bigger. You know, so it's like, hey, look at that! Now the now the cables are inside. But yeah, but if you if, if you you know make the head tube a lot bigger, then you're not really gaining anything, right? Um, so I think the real trick, even even today, is uh, is to get those cables inside, but but keep the head tube narrow. Yeah, I noticed with the um, when reading about the three T Strada, you you've made a thing about the head tube still super narrow, the cables are integrated, and they go like in front of the the steer it tube is that right like in front and then around uh yeah eventually you go around right but uh, <laughs> uh um yeah i mean it's exactly that right i mean the, the goal is to integrate these things but not yeah if you make a frame that's uh you know five inches wide you could fit anything inside right but that's not that's not really uh a very good overall result so certainly uh not just uh, not just for 3t right but for all good uh aero bike designers uh the goal is to still keep it narrow uh, unless there is a, a real reason not to. I mean, one of the big changes, I guess, that's happened across the bike industry, but seems to have been particularly difficult, maybe for aero bikes, is the advent of disc brakes. So it feels like, to my mind, aero frames are in a similar weight to that S3 was 13, 15 years ago. But but bikes have got heavier in general. Aerodynamically, how much of a challenge has that been for you to maintain the performance? Well, the aerodynamics of a disc brake is actually not that bad. Or put a different way, the aerodynamics of a rim brake is not very good. Right? Okay. So you always had, of course, this fork crown, and you stuck this uh, brake on top of it. And so now with you know taking that away, you see that whole transition between you know the front wheel with tire and the rim and the head tube there now you can make a much nicer shape uh so you gain it there and then of course you lose it a bit on the fork where you have to stick the the caliper on and the disc but overall um the difference between those two brake setups isn't isn't that big aerodynamically um if you're both you know optimizing both reasonably well um so the weight of course different story definitely <laughs> the disc brake is a lot uh, heavier and that so that has the effect on on aero bikes that uh, on UCI rules the aero bikes used to have zero weight penalty at the end because any frame could stay under 6.8 if it was well designed then you put some other light parts on it but now of course yeah you're absolutely right now you get to a lot of brands where you know let's say their climbing bike with rounder tubes can stay under the 6.8 but their aero frame will be over the 6.8 um so yeah, that, that has had an indirect negative effect on, uh, on on aero frames, I think. And you also see probably one of the reasons why now these sort of one frame that can do it all uh, stories are popping up, right? So if you can say, hey, I com can combine both, then um, you know you can save some weight because your tubes aren't as as deep and as as thin anymore as they used to be. Uh, but you have a good reason slash excuse for that. Um, and you, so you can save the weight, go under the UCI uh, limit again, and um, and the production also must be easier to make just one frame instead of two, right? So, yeah, I mean, do you think there's still a place for bikes to be optimized to be as light as possible, or do you feel like, as as you said in the early Cervelo Solus marketing material, that the aero is important for everyone? Is that trade off worth it? Yeah, I think I mean the the absolute delta between aero and non-aero is is still about the same as it was back then, right? So, um, 
So that trade-off hasn't really changed. It's just that both weights have gone up. Now that we have disc brakes a bit, um, but you know, there are other advantages to disc brakes, obviously. And I mean, I think all of this is a little irrelevant for most people, right? I mean, this is really important if you're riding the Tour de France, but if you're not Dan Lloyd, you know, and you're just riding normally, then, uh, you know, I mean, odds are you're not even on a on a racing bike anymore, but you're on a gravel bike. So, and there, you know, this is one of the great things that disc brakes have brought us, right? The complete freedom to put whatever tire in because you don't have to put a caliper over top of that tire anymore. So, so that freedom to that the, the disc brake brings you is in the end for normal cyclists, like uh, definitely like myself and a little bit like you. Um, you know, that, that has brought us 10 times more joy than uh, that last little ounce of uh, aerodynamics uh, that we could get on these old road bikes. Yeah, well, so I wouldn't go back, although I must say I absolutely loved riding that S3. But would you go back? I mean, how do you rate the performance of that era of S3 compared to, like, the 3T Strada, for example, like your latest aero road bike? Well, I mean, I think the latest bike is, of course, a much better bike. But I ride for fun. So is it more fun? I don't know. I ride this bike. That's why I put it there. You know, that's the non-aero version of that bike, right? Uh, R3SL. But, I mean, I ride that from time to time. And I enjoy it tremendously, right? I mean, I, I do aerobica events with a bike from 1970. And, you know, I I think that's a great time. When When you ride, I think a bike from 1970 or this bike or a bike today... I mean, the two things that, or I'd say the three things that enormously stand out is one, the performance of the braking. Um, you know, and I mean, this bike breaks fine, but I mean, a bike from the 70s, like, I don't know, you know, that's just a whole different uh, level of non-performance. Um, and then, you know, the shifting, right, the quality of the shifting, uh, that it just stays in your gear and all these kind of things is also a completely different world. And the third one is, uh, is the tire size. And I think those are the three things that really, uh, you know, make cycling much more enjoyable and accessible to people who are maybe less less into cycling. And the aerodynamics, you know, I mean, it's sort of the cherry on the cake if you want to go extra fast. But, I mean, if you're not riding the Tour de France, what, meaning fa- going fast just means you're home sooner, right? And once that? You've really surprised me there. I've, I've got to oh. say, I kind of ex- was expecting... I don't know, like, I was expecting, I think, for you to prioritize aerodynamics that little bit more. But, um, but yeah, super interesting. Oh, I mean, sorry about that. <laughs> no, no. Thank no, you. <laughs> you. I mean, do you think that if you're speaking purely aerodynamically, that, that the modern bikes still have the edge? Yes, for sure. Yeah, 100%. And, and what's, what's that? I mean, can you put a finger on what that's down to? Or is it a combination? I mean, the, so the, the shapes have just gotten better. I mean, the shapes have kept developing since uh, since the R3. So the shapes are better. The integration of parts is just better. So, you know, it's not just that, you know, that down tube has a better shape, but that down tube also does a better job of taking the airflow from the front wheel and straightening it out. Then the way the fork and the fork crown shape, you know, are integrated there has gotten a lot better since. Uh, then, of course, if done well, cables inside is much better. Shielding of the rear tire is much better. Uh, shielding of the water bottles has gotten better. Uh, so all these things have certainly gotten better. Where next, then? Is, has aero peaked? I mean, I don't think it has peaked in in, uh, in a sense that then it goes down again, right? But, but I mean, it is sort of that long tail, right? So, so yeah, you're, you're nearing that perfection. Um, and uh, yeah, not. I think also it has sort of peaked, in the sense that the interest probably has peaked, right? I mean, we're now, um, you know, more and more people are just are into just more, more diverse riding. Let's say, right? So a different terrain and all these kind of things. So other things, as we talked about before, like the tires, just become more important in people's decisions, and that then just 
you know, puts error down in the pecking order. So certainly if you got all of that taken into account as of course, I mean, we talked about earlier, like a 3T race max, of course, these kind of bikes do that where, you know, everything is perfect for a gravel, but then there's still aerodynamics. Certainly there's a, there's a market for that. Uh, but, but in the overall pecking order, aerodynamics has certainly gone down, uh, you know, 20 years ago, I don't think tire, tire clearance was in the top three, right. For people to make uh, decisions over. And, uh, and nowadays for a lot of, you know, road cyclists who now see themselves as road plus much more cyclists, uh, certainly those kind of things have, uh, as, uh, you know, have come up. Speaking personally, like I love an aero road bike, but I think if I, what would put me off slightly is having to go the next step and, and optimize everything. And, you know, so have my aero socks and my, you know, silly little 36 centimeter wide handlebars and stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? I've got like in my head, I've got classic aero race bike. I ride it and, you know, I think I'm Matthew Vanderpool or whatever, but like to actually then have to invest in that next level of kit in order to actually save all those extra watts. I think that's where I get. A little bit put off you know i mean if you were still obviously if you were selected for the tour de france you'd take that 36 centimeter handlebar immediately right yeah but if you're not then you know what for right well there is that yeah i mean i i do leave late to cycle to work most days so uh i definitely I don't think 36 centimeter handlebar is going to save you there <laughs> no, it's quite fast in traffic actually as well i will say um, oh, that's super cool. Jared, thank you so much for, for taking the time to talk to us today. No and, uh, give, us a bit of, give us a bit of history on, on the early days of Cervelo and then also get your thoughts on, on where things have come and, and where things are going next as well. So, uh, so thank you so much for that. And my pleasure. And, and is it true that Dan was one of your best test riders of all time, Daniel Lloyd? He was definitely in the top 40, yeah. <laughs> And is there anything on the subsequent S3 that we can attribute to Dan Lloyd as well? Like, uh, you know, a, a, any little... Uh, maybe Dan Lloyd just made me a nicer person because he's just a very nice person himself. He is. So maybe actually. it has very little to do with his cycling uh, with his cycling abilities, which were there as well, obviously. I mean, especially I remember uh, Tour of Flanders, uh, although that didn't end well, but... Um, cool. Anyway, thanks, Gerard, so much. Um, it's no been problem. an absolute pleasure.